Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 29th of July, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So Kane Warwick uh, from Synthetics uh, today put out this interesting tweet. Uh, I was quote tweeting Evan Van Ness here, and Kane says, you know, I would swap EIP-1559 for EIP-4844 in a second. It is more important than 1559. It nukes every alt, uh, alt L1 into oblivion. We need more awareness and momentum around this to avoid a multi-year implementation process like we had with EIP-1559. And then Tim Biker replied, but I want to kind of give some context around these for people who may not be aware. So 4844 is proto dank sharding for those who, who kind of like um, don't, don't remember that. There's a whole website dedicated to it. You can go check that out. If you just search like EIP 4844 on Google, the website should come up. Uh, and EIP 1559, you know, we obviously all know and love uh, that EIP there. Now, Kane referenced here kind of like this multi-year implementation process that we had to go through for EIP 1559 and not wanting to repeat the kind of like process for EIP 4844. And I'm in total agreement with him. I mean, I, I'm not in agreement with him about swapping the EIPs around but that's like a semantic issue like swapping it would take just uh, yeah I mean it's just it, it, it's kind of like not not something that would happen but it's kind of like funny how he framed it here I think he was doing that to kind of get some uh, kind of action on this tweet get some get some awareness around this tweet but basically the reason why 1559 took so long uh, at least a major reason and probably the main reason was because it sat in limbo for a while now for those of you who don't know it took about two and a half years from when EIP 1559 was drafted as an EIP to when it went into the network and I would say that at least a year of that time was wasted. It was wasted because there was no one coordinating the effort for 1559. No one really knew what was happening on the development side of things. Uh, and it didn't really have anyone kind of like uh, monitoring the, the work on it. And then I think probably even more than a year, at least a year into 1559's EIP being kind of like in draft stage, if not 18 months, Tim Biko came along and basically said, hey, I'm going to coordinate this thing. We need to get this thing built and implemented. And that's when I would say the real work started. I, I, I think before that, it was there was some research going on. There was some development going on, but it really was stuck in limbo for a long time. And also the resources weren't there either because it was a bear market uh, and it just, yeah, you know, the people resources weren't there, the money wasn't there, money was tighter and all that stuff as well. So that I think is the main reason. Um, now, in terms of like not letting us fall into the same trap for 4844, I don't think we can because we have the coordination now. The Ethereum core development is in the best place it's ever been in, as I've mentioned before. Um, and as Tim Biker replied to Kane here, he said, you know, for 4844, the, big, the biggest bottleneck right now is probably engineers. And they have a call tomorrow to discuss the progress, or I think today to discuss the pro progress. Um, and Optimism and Coinbase are the two teams who are helping push out the code here, along with all the KZG folks as well. Um, and then Tim continues by saying, and to go even further, I think for the next two to three people, each extra full-time engineer on this with the right background, client uh, client code, DevOps, node running and testing for the next six months meaningfully increases the odds this is ready for the next hard fork, which would be Q2-ish next year. Um, so I guess, yeah, like 12 months from, oh, less than 12 months from now, uh, depending on when in Q2, kind of like you, you point to. Um, but 4844 has been worked on for a while already. It's been obviously in research phase and there's been kind of like test nets and dev nets spun up and it is really uh, high as a priority for everyone in the Ethereum core, e core development ecosystem because we know how important it is for layer twos to be able to kind of collapse their costs in order to compete with these alternative layer ones out there that may be offering those cheaper fees. And I've discussed 4844 or proto dank sharding in detail before so i'm not going to go over that there but yeah i really do think it's not going to be stuck in development hell it's not going to take us a long time to get this implemented i feel like once the merge is done uh basically all the focus is going to shift to that and and beacon chain withdrawals they're the two major things that need to basically happen in the next i guess like six to twelve months after the merge uh, and as I've said before, there may be separate hard forks. It may just be like a standalone beacon chain withdrawal hard fork, maybe six months after the merge. Then we do the proto dank sharding another six months after the merge. But it, they definitely have to happen. Both have to happen as soon as possible for completely different reasons, but still both are very, very important. So just wanted to give some kind of like color around that because I know a lot of people would have seen Kane's tweet today, but he is right. We do need to get this shipped. We do need to get these layer two costs down uh, kind of like uh, to as cheaply as possible. Like it's, it's already really cheap, right? Like especially at a layer one gas prices as they are today, but 
if we can get them to sub cent transaction uh, kind of uh, fees uh, for, for something like a swap on a layer two uh, in the next six to 12 months, that would be a huge win for Ethereum. And that would kill a lot of the alt L1 kind of, um, I guess, like momentum. I think a lot of it's been killed already. I think a lot of the momentum came to alt L1s ones due to liquidity mining incentives, which only really work in a bull market. And I've seen the communities around these alt L1s. ones, I say communities lightly here, they're not really communities, but I've seen pretty much all the social kind of, I guess, um, what should, how, how do I how do I put this? The kind of like social signals around them basically evaporate since the prices went down. So I do think we've got time, but at the same time, we shouldn't base upgrades for Ethereum based on kind of like market uh, market dynamics or anything like that. And they never have been based on that. So once the merge is done, I hope that we can keep pushing towards 4844 at full steam ahead. And I think we will. I don't think it's going to be held up like 1559 was. It's definitely not going to fall in development, into development hell with the amount of people that are involved with it, the amount of people that want it. Uh, and you know, with one five five nine, it was a different thing. A lot of people viewed one five five nine as a thing that just to pump ETH. Like for bet, for if it was right or wrong, it doesn't matter. That's what they viewed it as. Whereas forty eight forty four, you can't argue that it's going to pump ETH because it's got nothing to do with with ETH, right? It's got to do with making sure that we can scale layer one Ethereum uh, uh, enough so that layer twos can get the really cheap transaction fees there. So yeah, cool to see this. Uh, I guess like a tweet put out by Kane to raise awareness around this, and great to see Tim Biker replying here. All right, another core development news. Uh, I, I think I spoke about this academic grants round that the Ethereum Foundation was doing a little while ago. Well, uh, the grantees were just announced for this. So Danny Ryan shared this blog post on Twitter where he said where it's titled Academic Grants Round Grantee Announcement. And you can kind of like see the breakdown of where more than $2 million has gone. It's been allocated to th across 39 grants in seven different categories, uh, spanning from economics to P2P networking to formal verification. And here's a breakdown of everyone that's going to be working on uh, uh, this and and a lot of them are PA, a lot of PhDs here. It feels a little bit like Cardano reading this list, but uh, they're going to be doing a lot of research here on uh, across basically all of these categories. And I mean, you can get a breakdown of this if you go uh, look at the blog post yourself. But this is awesome. I mean, the fact that the Ethereum Foundation has so much capital now to deploy to things like this is great. I mean, I know there's a meme that they sell the top uh, on ETH. They kind of did some good trades during the bull market. But I think they have hundreds of millions of dollars uh, sitting, not sitting there, but like, you know, they're, they're going to be able to put the work in fiat. And they've also got obviously their ETH, ba ETH bags that, uh, that they haven't they haven't sold all of it. They still got it there. Um, but they're very, very well capitalized right now. And they're putting that capital to use, which is very, very awesome to see. And it's not just to use on the core development side. Uh, it's also to use on the research side, which is something that definitely uh, is probably underfunded at this point, but is getting more funding. So if you want to see a breakdown of this, you can. Uh, I'll link it in the, this blog post in the YouTube description below for you to check out. All right, so Swell Network's mainnet release candidate is now alive. This means that Swell Network is only one step away from mainnet go live. So this is obviously on testnet as a mainnet release candidate, which means that this will be the candidate that goes to mainnet. So that's... That, that's why they're only one step away here. Now, just a reminder for people out there, Swell is a new liquid staking uh, provider, uh, kind of similar to a Rocket Pool or a Lido, uh, obviously, uh, you've all heard about that before. Uh, but yeah, great to see that they're kind of like at their last stage before they were able to hit mainnet here. I mean, I, I spoke about this yesterday, so I'm not going to rehash it now, but more competition is going to lead to a better, more healthier, and more diverse staking ecosystem. And it's just going to lead to more competition between the existing kind of like staking providers out there and lead to them uh, kind of like, uh, because of that more com competition, being more, more I guess like, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I guess like they're, they're going to be quicker in how they release things and how they kind of like uh, do things and come to market with things. And we already saw this kind of play out with Lido's dominance going up so quickly. It really did spur on uh, Rocket Pool to act. And they and they did, they acted quite quickly and they've got a bunch of things coming as I've spoken about before, but they even acted on the marketing front with with kind of like Bankless, which I thought was, uh, was, was really good as well. So yeah, cool to see that Swell's mainnet release candidate is live on, uh, is now live uh, and they're only one step away from uh, mainnet. All right, so uh, just this tweet here that I came across today from an account on Twitter uh, called Drop Knowledge here, where he said, taught my mum about zero knowledge proofs today. Uh, the use case she came up with was, quote, so a real estate agent could simply check if my net worth met their qualifications, but I wouldn't have to reveal the actual amount to them, end quote. And then, he, and then they go on and say, hell yeah, mum. This is a very, very simple kind of explanation of how zero knowledge proofs work, but I think it's really relatable because... 
I mean, ZKP, zero knowledge stuff, like it gets talked about all the time, but he's definitely still very confusing for a lot of people. But this very simple example here, I think clicks for a lot of people. And the tweet was very popular, as you can see on the engagement here. But basically, you know, the, the fact that we can prove that something is true without having to reveal what it is, is incredibly powerful. And I've talked about this before. There's so many use cases for this. There's so many things that we haven't even thought of yet. And there's going to be so many developments on this front as well. So very uh, excited to obviously keep on top of that. But I think this is just a great way to explain to people how zero knowledge proofs um, can be applied, you know, practically rather than just like theoretically. And especially, I guess, in the crypto context, uh, there are ways to kind of like show this as well and use a crypto thing. So you could say, you know, so you uh, not just a real estate agent, but like a, an exchange, for example, could check if your net worth met their qualifications for one of their, I guess, like uh, exchange accounts, like one of their premium exchange accounts, and you wouldn't have to reveal the actual amount to them. Like that, I mean, it extends to every use case you can think of. It doesn't have to be just a real estate agent, right? So, so yeah, I thought this was just a really easy way to understand uh, kind of like the practical uses of zero knowledge proofs. All right, so Stephen Goldfeder, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Offchain Labs here that develop Arbitrum, has put together a thread uh, titled, uh, titled, I guess, like the first tweet starts off by saying, some scattered thoughts on Arbitrum Nitro, ZK rollups, and plumbing. Now, this is not <laughs> this is not plumbing, like the physical plumbing, the water, <laughs> the water plumbing. This is kind of like infrastructure plumbing. Um, but essentially, this thread, I highly recommend giving it a read. But what this thread is, is basically Stephen giving his kind of thoughts on how he believes Arbitrum Nitro is still the best solution out there right now to scale Ethereum. And the reason why they kind of like went with Arbitrum AVM to start with is because that was the best at the time. Now Nitro is the best, so they, they're kind of like getting rid of the AVM. And then he also says that when ZK proofs and when uh, kind of like ZK tech gets to a point where he thinks it's better than the current optimistic wall-up tech, then he's completely open to making Arbitrum into something more ZK-like, right? And I've said this since basically the beginning that I've, uh, that I've been talking about optimistic roll-ups on the refuel. These optimistic wall-up teams aren't just going to sit there and be like, okay, well, you know, this ZK tech works and is better than our optimistic roll-ups. We're just going to keep doing our optimistic roll-up stuff. No, they're going to do what's best today and what works today to give people something practical to use today. And then as things evolve, as the tech matures more, they're going to adopt it. And look, there are teams that are just kind of going straight into ZK proofs, straight into kind of like zero knowledge rollups, and that's all fine and dandy, but no zero knowledge rollup, there's no ZKVM on mainnet, right? There's no zero knowledge rollup that comes kind of like close to the activity of Optimism and Arbitrum. There's no generalized ZK rollup that does that. There obviously is ZK rollups out there that have, have some traction uh, like DYDX and, uh, and Loopring, but they're not the they're not equivalent to what Arbitrum and Optimism are in terms of like generalized kind of EVM equivalent slash compatible uh, smart contracting that you can do on there. They're they're limited. They have their own limitations, right? So I highly recommend giving this read uh, this thread a read from Stephen. It does hit home on that point that I've been trying to hit home on in that in the fact that optimistic rollups are not obsolete. Uh, they're still very, very good technology. They still work very well. And if they do end up becoming obsolete and getting superseded by ZK technology, well, then Arbitrum and Optimism can both adopt this. And it actually shouldn't be hard for them to do this either. Like, I feel like they've been preparing already uh, and they're kind of like looking into ways to do it if they were to do it. And I feel like uh, it's not going to be a difficult thing uh, for them to do. So maybe it, requ it would require like a lot of coordination, but I don't think they're going to have to do a regenesis or anything like that in order to do it. So that would be cool as well. But uh, yeah, definitely recommend giving this thread a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so speaking of Arbitrum, there's also this thread here on updates of the Arbitrum Rinkeby migration, uh, which is uh, kind of... Um I guess uh, upgrading the Arbitrum uh, Rinkeby to Nitro. Uh, sorry, I had my, my, lost my words there a little bit. Uh, and as you guys know, you know this was done. I think this is all done successfully. You can you can see here the Arbitrum Rinkeby migration to Nitro has successfully been completed as of 15 hours ago, and the Explorer is also up as well. So this is just running through the testnet motions, and then we can expect mainnet in about two to three weeks, I would say, from from today, which is very exciting, of course. And then I wonder how long it'll be before they turn the Odyssey event back on. Will they do it at the same time? Like, would you imagine them doing, you know, the Nitro upgrade and then basically within the same day saying, hey, Odyssey is turned back on, go wild, right? Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll wait a couple of days just to see if everything went well with the upgrade, then turn Odyssey back on. But either way, I, I don't imagine them waiting very long to do it because Odyssey was honestly, like it was leading to a lot of usage of the Arbitrum chain. There were a lot of people onboarding. There was a lot of excitement around it. 
obviously totally understand why they had to pause it because of the, f the fact that, that the network was getting congested and Nitro wasn't live yet. And they were really focused on Nitro instead of uh, kind of like trying to band-aid fix the, the current kind of like network or, or do some kind of solution to to scale it up, but only in like a short-term solution. Uh, so yeah, that was paused. Obvi uh, obviously, I, I covered that on the refuel a few weeks ago, uh, and I'm sure it'll be restarted in the next few weeks once Nitro is live. So great to see that the Rinkeby migration went through successfully. You can check out the Block Explorer if you want to here as well. It's linked in this little thread. I'll link that in the description below for you. All right, so speaking of optimistic rollups, there was an interesting announcement from uh, Synapse Protocol here, or Synapse Protocol. I'm not pronouncing that right either way, but uh, I'll just say Synapse Protocol here. They've introduced something called Synapse Chain. Now, I read this on Twitter, and I was like, oh, God, here we go. Another kind of like um, another Cosmos chain, right? Like, you guys know my views on them. So I'm not going to rehash that. Uh, but it's not. It's actually an optimistic rollup. So in this blog post, they basically detail what, what it is. I'm still not confused, but I'm still kind of like not, I don't have a total understanding of like exactly what this is because they do call it a sovereign execution environment. But the thing is, is that I think they're using the term sovereign wrong because there, there are such things as kind of like sovereign rollups, but they're not true, op, like it's not a true optimistic rollup because it could it has its data somewhere else, but it has a settlement on Ethereum, right? So that, those things do exist. But the thing is, is that, if you're a sovereign rollup, then you're not kind of like a full true optimistic rollup, for example, right? Because you're storing your data elsewhere. You're not storing it on Ethereum. But if you read in the blog post, they do say that they're going to be storing the data and settling on Ethereum. So yeah, it just kind of like confused me a little bit. And I'm still waiting for smarter people to kind of like dig into this and and kind of see what happens here. But essentially what, they want, what they're wanting Synapse Chain to be here is an execution environment uh, for, for bridging between. So basically the way I understand it is that there'll be an optimistic rollup that basically acts as, acts as a, hu a hub of liquidity and then everything can basically plug into this and, and essentially use that liquidity in there. So for example, I think this is one use case. If you're on Arbitrum and you use the Synapse Bridge and you say, hey, I'm on Arbitrum, my liquidity is here, but I want to use an app on Optimism. Well, then you can use this bridge as the kind of like execution environment to do that. And that's my understanding of it. And they detail all of this in the blog post, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. Um, but yeah, I'm still digesting this. It seems like they've kind of uh, come up with something new here rather than just like a strict optimistic rollup. It seems like a bit of a hybrid uh, and it doesn't, it, and I have to, really kind of like dig deeper into this to know exactly, you know, where the security lies and where the weakest link lies and stuff like that. But it is very, very cool to see uh, people experimenting with obviously optimistic rollup technology and layer two technology in general beyond what we've seen in the past. Like I think this is the first kind of like layer two chain or kind of like rollup chain that's focused on the bridging side of things. Obviously the rollups themselves have uh, kind of like bridging between them, uh, sorry, bridges into them. They're, they're official bridges. Obviously, there are things like Hop Protocol and Connect, but Hop isn't its own dedicated chain, right? Like neither is Connect. Um, and then Synapse Chain coming out with this basically uh, uh, kind of like uh, uh, puts a spin on on the bridging that we're used to, which I think is cool. But it's not just the bridging as well. They also say they're a generic cross-chain messaging system. And I've spoken about these before. There was the Starkware DAMM and uh, Rari's Nova thing. I don't know if Rari's Nova thing is going to go anywhere. Uh, Rari kind of fell apart, I believe. Um, and then you also have uh, Starkware's DAMM. Uh, which I haven't really heard much about. But the the thing is, is that like the technology still remains. Like people can still build this thing. And arbitrary generic cross-chain messaging would allow for what I just mentioned. That basically being able to, I don't know, say you want to trade, uh, 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 you're on Arbitrum and you want to trade in a liquidity pool that's on Optimism. Well, you could execute that trade using Synapse Chain, for example, and that would pass the message to Optimism and then do it all in the background and then and then send uh, the kind of a result back to you on, on Arbitrum, right? So like if that is what this is and kind of like they've uh, basically made it so that it's very seamless for the end user, this is a big deal. But as I said, I'm still kind of like digging into this. I'm still talking to people about it, still trying to get to the, the bottom of how it all works and how secure it is. But this is very, very cool. I'll keep you guys updated on, you know, the, the more I come across, uh, kind of like the more answers I come across here. But you should give this blog post a read for yourself as well to check out what they've created. There's a lot of detail here. Um, but 
you know, I me, I'm forever the skeptic of detail that comes from the official team. I definitely obviously like talking to third parties about it because the the, the official team is always going to sugarcoat anything bad with it or any trade-offs with it, right? They're not going to give you like the full nitty-gritty ugliness of it. They're not going to show you exactly how the sausage is made, right? At least most of the teams won't. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, you want to kind of like showcase your product. You want to showcase the power of it. But I definitely want to see uh, some third parties look into this and kind of like give a, a kind of um, an idea of what this kind of, what this actually is and where it, where it fits in the, in the layer two spectrum. All right. So speaking of layer twos, there is uh, uh, Mutable announced early access today for the GameStop NFT partnership that they have. So there's an early access Immutable uh, X layer two integration for the GameStop wallet. So if you're interested in participating in this early access, you can check out this blog post here. It has a guide on how to do it. It's very simple. You just basically set up your Immutable X key. You kind of like deposit in and it's uh, with your GameStop wallet. And it seems like it's uh, it's all well and good and all works perfectly there. So cool to see that there's an early access this year it's it's funny because gamestop is doing nft stuff on both loop ring and immutable x and i'm wondering like i'm wondering if that fragments things like i'm a fan of both immutable x and loop ring but i do wonder long term what that looks like does you know one chain get more usage than another how much kind of like uh effort does gamestop put into loop ring versus immutable x or vice versa right so that's something that i'm very curious about i'm, I'm obviously still really happy to see gamestop kind of doing this sorts of uh, stuff with these leading l2 providers but I always get a bit weary about the, I guess, maybe splitting of resources for these teams because GameStop obviously is a big company, all, all that sort of stuff, but I doubt they have like a, a huge uh, blockchain team, right? Um, and they also are kind of like working with these partners so that, and these partners are going to expect like some sort of, I mean, a certain amount of attention, a certain amount of kind of like work being put towards their own solution. So I'm just wondering what the long-term kind of like play is here. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know which, which is going to kind of win out, but I don't imagine there being too long-term. It, it just, just from kind of like the virtue of the fact of the attention, the awareness, the development, the network effect, we're going to have to see, right? Uh, and, and I think that's true for a lot of things in crypto is like people get excited because they're like, oh, you know, this is supporting this, this, and this. And it's like, okay, well, it's kind of like fragmenting. Like we're going to have to kind of consolidate over the long term, which I think it happens just naturally anyway, especially during the the bear market. We we So it's kind of like in the bull market, you have like an expansion, right? You have this massive explosion of everything happening and everything seems like it's going well because it's a bull market. And then you have the bear market where there's a massive contraction and things blow up. We've seen so many things blow up over the last six months. And the things that kind of like stick around and make it to the next bull market are the ones that actually have tangible real value and, and, and that are people are actually interested in using. Uh, but there, there are some that stick around because they just raise a lot of money in the bull market. And they're kind of like what I like to call zombie projects where they're surviving on that money. But in reality, they don't really have a user base. So yeah, it, it happens across the entire industry. But just in terms of kind of like GameStop's approach here, I'm curious to see, you know, long term, if both of these things succeed, if both Immutable X and Loopring succeed with GameStop working on both of them, or if it's, if it's uh, one of those that eventually win out. All right, so Argent has put together a thread about ZK Sync 2.0 today, and apparently over 250 dApps are building for ZK Sync 2.0's launch, with many in stealth. And they say, now is the perfect time to learn all about it and why ZK Sync 2.0 will be a game changer for crypto adoption. You can read this thread, I'll link it in the YouTube description below, obviously not going to read it through on the refuel, but 250 apps, I doubt that number, only because that's a lot, right? I'm wondering like how many of those apps are actually things that people want to use as well. Uh, and uh, apparently there's many in stealth too, which is, which is cool. We'll have to see. Like, I think that it's funny because there is kind of like this handful of big apps on every chain. And then there's like a long tail of apps on, on, on the kind of like each chain, you basically have a popular AMM, right? Which is usually a fork of Uniswap. <laughs> and then you have like a popular money market, uh, you may have some derivative protocols, you may have some options protocols, but really the two biggest ones are always the AMM and, and the money market, really. Um, and maybe a stable coin, and like maybe an AMM for just stable coins, right? But, and then there's kind of like the long tail of apps where it's kind of hard to know which of these actually has value because a lot of the time, maybe the token's going up and they have some liquidity mining program and people pile in and maybe it lasts a couple of months or maybe it lasts six months, but then eventually they kind of pile out. So it's very hard to know, especially in bull markets, which ones are going to be the ones that stick around and which ones aren't. But I think 
as time goes on, as we kind of develop more and more of these apps, as we kind of come to come to see which ones work, which ones don't, which ones have staying power, I think you know we can very easily say AMMs and money markets, uh, the two with the most staying power. You want to you can put stable coins in there. I actually consider stable coins to be an application. Obviously, stable coins are always going to be popular no matter where they are. Again, though, it's hard to tell which stable coins are going to stay around. Like, I mean, look at UST. Everyone thought UST was going to be, you know, this huge stable coin was going to be around forever. It was going to kill everything and it killed itself in the end. Uh, and, 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 and obviously, DAI has been around for a while and we have confidence in DAI. USDC and USDT, we also have confidence in, maybe even BUSD. Uh, but stable coins just as a general thing, Definitely something that uh, that kind of like is popular on any chain. Like I'm talking layer twos, layer one, side chains, whatever you want to call it. There, there is a dominant path there. So there is obviously going to be a bunch of those on zk sync 2.0. But I'm wondering what those long tail apps are. Are they just kind of like useless things? Are a lot of them just NFT projects? We'll have to wait and see. But I recommend giving this thread a read from Argent regardless. And I'm curious to see which what these apps are when zk sync 2.0 goes live. All right, so another preview of uh, upcoming Rainbow features today. So apparently they're adding a profiles kind of, uh, I guess, like feature here. And you can see here uh, a screenshot of this, or I guess like basically a graphic of the different kind of profile things. And uh, PED here gives a description of being able to register an ENS.eth uh, name directly within Rainbow, create a profile by setting ENS records, view a profile, uh, which looks so good apparently according to PED, view other profiles uh, and search for .eth names and their expiry date. And you can see, in the screenshots here what it basically looks like the funny thing is is that i feel like at this point in time there's like a handful of these wallets and and portfolio trackers that are really like competing to be your one-stop shop for i guess like all your on-chain activities there's rainbow there's zappa there's zirion uh there's argent there's a few others out there and i zappa have, has their mobile app uh, as well and I don't like. I think they're doing more there. They want to do like a wallet um, and stuff too. Uh, but yeah, it feels like there's really a race here. And I just noticed I'm in the create your ENS profile screenshot here. That's that's fun. Um, but yeah, it really feels like there's a race here to normify the, I guess, like wallet experience, which is what we need at the end of the day. We need to make wallets fun. We need to make them more versatile. We need to make them really easy to use. And we need to make it so that people can have access to everything within them, right? Like obviously their NFTs and and the, the gov governance stuff that they're doing and, and kind of like uh, exploring new stuff, like what, what Zappa has done with Zappa V2. So I'm really excited about this because as you guys know, and as I've talked about before, wallets are the front door for the on-chain ecosystem. That's never going to change. Like, uh, I mean, okay, never going to change in terms of the fact that like a wallet is what we use, right? But wallet is kind of like what we're all, or what we're all used to, and the wallet can be made to do whatever you want it to do. But in terms of accessing these products, there are also other ways where you can have centralized kind of like um, businesses sitting on top and using the underlying protocols and all that sorts of stuff and building interfaces similar to this, but being custodial. But in terms of like a non-custodial, fully fledged Ethereum ecosystem experience, I think Rainbow and Zappa are really the leaders at this point in time in terms of kind of like uh, what I've seen. Arjun is definitely a leader as well, and they're 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 a pioneer on the layer two side uh, and they're obviously trying to do different things with social cover and things like that but in terms of beautifying the experience uh rainbow and zappa seem to be at the forefront maybe i'm missing some others out there please let me know if i am uh but yeah i i just love the designs that they have and you guys know i'm not really a mobile wallet user so i mean i do have rainbow installed and i do play around with it but i just i don't really use it because i don't use mobile for a lot of things um but i'm a heavy heavy zappa user like i use it pretty much every day um so yeah i mean i i think that most people in in Ethereum that like a regular on-chain users would use one of one of these things, whether it be Rainbow, Zappa, Zerion, Argent, whatever it is. Um, but I I think as I was saying before, it's going to consolidate eventually into the best product, into the best applications out there. And I think the race is getting tighter and tighter as uh, as time goes on. All right, so uh, this new, I guess, like uh, Twitter account, not, I don't know if this is a new Twitter account, I hadn't heard of it before, but this Twitter account called Swipe has announced today that if you're a DAO or part of a DAO, you'll be able to connect your Gnosis Safe wallets directly to an FDIC insured bank account. 
that's really cool. I, that basically is blending the Web 2 and Web 3 worlds together, right? Connecting uh, a DAO, uh, or your, can I, sorry, connecting your Gnosis Safe Wallet to uh, an FDIC insured bank account. Now, FDIC is kind of, uh, 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 I don't know if it's an insurance company or something in the US, but it's, I think Coinbase uses this as well. I'm just going to quickly look it up. Federal, Accenture Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Yeah, I've got I've got no idea what it is. I'm not in the US, so I don't know. But essentially, it just provides insurance for for, for kind of like funds here. Um, and you can see the interface here of basically connecting your your kind of like Gnosis Safe wallet to uh, this. And, and I think this is what Swipe enables. I hadn't heard of Swipe before. I think they've been around for a little while here. But basically, this is what Swipe enables, which I thought was was pretty cool. I I, I think that's pretty cool because it's also non custodial as well. Obviously. The bank account isn't non-custodial, but the the Gnosis Safe wallets are, and being able to kind of use that within this context is 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 pretty cool, and it's pretty cool to see the worlds being uh, blended together here. So you can check this out. I'll link in the YouTube description below. Running out of time here, just the last couple of things to get through. Um, so Spruce put out a tweet today saying, as mentioned previously, we're researching how developers get started when building DApps to learn more about how we can best support signing with Ethereum development. If you are a developer and have three to five minutes, we'd love to hear your feedback. So if you are a developer, you have some time, just go to this general survey here and kind of like fill it out and give Spruce your feedback. I think it'd be very valuable for them. Uh, and it does. And as I said, it only takes three to five minutes here. So definitely go do that. I'll link it in the YouTube description. And finally, just another bankless shout out here today. They have a live stream that I believe by the time the refill has gone out has already aired and ended. So you should go check out this video. It is a, I guess, panel debate between uh, Jordi Bailina, Alex Gut Gluchowski and Yi Zhang uh, from Polygon, ZK Sync or Matalabs and Scroll respectively all about ZK EVMs and it's being co-hosted sorry it's been hosted by David Hoffman with a co-host Ben Jones from Optimism this is a stacked panel I can't wait to watch this myself I think it's live right now actually but one, you know obviously uh, once you guys watch this, it'll be live. Definitely go check it out. Just wanted to give a shout out on that one. But I think on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks, everyone.